so uh good uh, good evening uh, we are here as the continuation of our last uh, you know last um, cvs teaching and uh, i have a few questions that we missed last day uh, we have dr krishna chaitanya he is asking about the supranormal period so uh, the supranormal period is this period actually let me explain this is uh, the cardiac action potential of working myocardial cell on your screen and you can see that up to this is the absolute refractory period and after that this zone is the relative refractory period so relative refractory period is the period of cardiac action potential when less than threshold that means sub threshold stimuli can ignite another you know action potential so this is the time when there is a chance of increased automaticity increased automaticity so increased automaticity means there is a chance of increased ectopic bits so increased automatic automaticity means there's a chance of increased ectopic bits so actually what happens this is the time when we can find if the heart is supranormally stimulated if the heart is stimulated by a second stimulus and if that is even lower than the action lower than the threshold even then there is a chance of increased automaticity there is a chance of decreased threshold therefore a chance of increased you know a second action potential at this time and there is a chance of a particular phenomena which we call r on t phenomena so this r on t phenomenon is an ecg uh, you know ecg finding we will also cover up ecg today so one thing for the first year students is that r on t phenomena is a supranormal phenomena which can occur during the relative refractory period if you or if the heart gets a less than normal or sub threshold stimuli also there's a chance of increased automaticity which can generate an ectopic big and which can ultimately lead to ultimately lead to arrhythmia arrhythmia mean rhythm disturbances so the important rhythm disturbances i don't know whether any student of the final year classes or even beyond they are listening to in that case the what i am going to tell right now they can understand this arrhythmia the commonest arrhythmia that can occur from supranormal period is vt ventricular tachycardia but i i really thank dr krishna chaitanya over here as he has asked me about the supranormal period uh, we don't we generally don't get this questions in the first prof at least in the written portion but uh, the students who are heading towards uh, getting uh, securing an honors mark they might be asked about this so once again i let me summarize supranormal period is the relative refractory period basically and at this time why it is supranormal because now the threshold is a little bit higher so you give a little more energy you give a sub threshold energy heart will be ignited again ap will be generated again and at this time we can find an arrhythmic phenomenon on ecg that means it can cause an arrhythmia ectopic bit it can cause an automatic bit and it can lead to vt or ventricular tachycardia which is a lethal phenomenon again we'll know about this when we shall be in our final year in medicine but vt ventricular tachycardia is a lethal thing lethal disturbance of rhythm in heart so with this we'll move to today's topic actually uh, i can i can't say any more uh, new question over here like um, somebody first poll lemon i have discussed yes last day dr shorkar has asked me dr debra sarkar and how can slow ap produce first rhythm in sn dr shai kirti i have i have discussed about it dr krishna chaitanya also had some few few other questions i have discussed good evening good afternoon i don't think any answer is available for this and can s for s4 is also we have discussed a lot back, a lot back basically someone has asked about my number but uh, that is out of the context so uh, now we shall move into uh, cardiac output again very important for the uh, you know prof exam so ladies and gentlemen and friends and students uh, whoever is uh, listening to this uh, the app is available for your live questions if you have any question you can simply chat uh, to me and during the uh, break 
I will go through all these questions and all the relevant questions will be uh, answered. Uh, so if you don't, if you don't understand a particular topic or if you don't, uh, you know, you don't, uh, or if you have any particular query regarding this, um, any relevant query will be answered. So what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is basically is the product of stroke volume into heart rate. Remember, this is very important. Cardiac output, you will face the question as a broad question, also as a short question and also the regulation everything you need to know about the cardiac output if you don't know about cardiac output my humble suggestion will be drop the exam don't go to the exam that time because you won't pass so for passing this is very basic cardiac output very basic so what is cardiac output the volume of blood that is ejected out of heart due to its contraction and relaxation whatsoever due to a particular cardiac cycle in one minute so the volume of blood this is that is ejected out of heart in one minute is cardiac output and it means it is equal to stroke volume into heart rate this is very important stroke volume and heart rate so what is stroke volume now it comes to that question stroke volume is volume of blood that is ejected out of ventricle per stroke stroke means per contraction and heart rate gives us the number of strokes heart has to go through heart has to create in one minute so if we just get a product of this that amounts to cardiac output so remember the normal stroke volume is approximately 130 ml per ventricle and heart rate is approximately 72 bits per minute but remember friends we don't have exactly 72 bits per minute we have a heart rate and it has a range the range of heart rate is 60 to 100 bits per minute anything above 100 is known as tachycardia very important for your exam and anything below 60 is known as bradycardia and there are a lot of reasons of tachycardia and bradycardia you know i'm giving you a uh, little bit zoomed in view so tachycardia and bradycardia so there are a lot of reasons of tachycardia and bradycardia and some of the reasons are physiological some other reasons are pathological you need to know about them so coming back to the bradycardia physiological reasons and tachycardia physiological reasons so we are just uh, just uh, i am providing you some um, table which will help you to counter the viva questions because this bradycardia or tachycardia they will appear in viva mostly rather than the you know the written examination so bradycardia physiological a little bit explanation is required and bradycardia pathological a little, little bit explanation is required uh, what i believe that most of you by now you know what physiological means what pathological means but maybe there might be some students who have started late so physiological means in health whereas pathological means in disease so physiological reasons of bradycardia means the healthy reason the the bradycardia what are the situations in health when bradycardia can occur and bradycardia can occur in lionel messi what's that Lionel Messi is a sports person, is an athlete. Bradycardia can occur in Usain Bolt. So, bradycardia physiological can occur in trained athletes. This is the first thing and we call it athletic bradycardia. What is the reason? Because trained, trained athlete, they have trained heart. They have trained myocardium. So their myocardium are capable of generating more stroke volume. If you can generate a more stroke volume from this equation, you can see our product is cardiac output. If this is high, we require a lower HR to develop the same cardiac output. So these people, all the trained athlete, all the young male, they have a physiological bradycardia. However, pathological bradycardia is of concern and that can occur during block what are the blocks it can be atrioventricular block and there are multiple types of av block like one degree two degree three degree and there are also mobich classification once we get into the ecg part we'll discuss all of them so right now you understand that there are certain blocks which can cause pathological bradycardia also there are certain dyselectrolytemia that means disturbance in electrolytes like sodium has increased or sodium has decreased and more importantly potassium has increased or potassium has decreased so dyselectrolytemia electrolyte disturbances 
electrolytemia they can cause the bradycardia and there are pathological these are diseases coming to the tachycardia yes most of us are having tachycardia during exercise very common and then during pregnancy which is also another reason of tachycardia and also we can get you know tachycardia when you have some kind of stress but that is also within the healthy level you are going to face a viva and you are facing tachycardia or having tachycardia that's normal once the viva is over once the stressor is taken out your heart rate will come back between that 60 to 100 bits per minute but there are pathological tachycardia also and pathological tachycardia are actually caused by diseases so major diseases or major most common diseases or most common symptoms which can cause pathological tachycardia fever now we all know the whole of india is going through this covid crisis and fever is one of the chief symptoms of covid so fever can cause pathological tachycardia apart from that there is chance of thyrotoxicosis what is that thyrotoxicosis is a part of thyroid storm hyperthyroidism thyroid gland is the metabolically active gland and when thyroid gland is hyperactive it can increase the rate of metabolism as thyroid gland can increase the rate of metabolism we can see there is increased rate of heartbeat we can find in in this situation so there is many situations we can find tachycardia during you know heart failure that is one situation we can find tachycardia during you know heart attack the meaning the uh, you know the actual meaning of heart attack is a my acute myocardial infarction but remember depending on the vascular territory heart attack can also cause bradycardia so heart attack myocardial infarction heart failure all of this can cause pathological tachycardia or pathological bradycardia so that's all here now we will move forward so we have already known about the cardiac output what is the basic value of cardiac output again very important and i have seen almost in every alternate years the value of cardiac output has been asked in the university exam multiple university all through india so cardiac output is 5 liter per minute so the next question comes is what is cardiac index that is very important suppose you have a patient who is a dwarf and you have a patient who is a wwe wrestler so the cardiac output of these two people will vary but this will not give us the proper picture of their heart's ability or their cardiac function so what is the difference what is the determining what is the deterring feature what is the deterring factor over here the factor is they have different body mass they have different body surface area so a bigger person is having bigger cardiac output a greater cardiac output and a smaller person having lesser cardiac output but that doesn't mean that smaller person have lesser cardiac function lesser heart efficiency so we need a particular value which will standardize this body surface area or which will standardize the mass so bigger person he must have big heart smaller person he will have small heart but it will still become still be an efficient heart so what is cardiac index cardiac index is cardiac output divided by body surface area this is very important so cardiac output divided by body surface area what is cardiac output cardiac output you know that is something called you know x by y if we just take it like that so cardiac output is liter per minute and body surface area is you know meter square so this is the equation this is the you know the unit liter per minute per meter square that is the unit and you can get there are variable you know calculation of uh, cardiac index we call it cardiac index x comes back to 5 liter per minute whereas meter square it comes back to 1.5 to 1.53 as per your textbook you just divide it 5 by 1.53 will get the value it will come around 3 point something but this one is important liter per minute per meter square so regarding this what we have done so far one is the definition of cardiac output then the product of cardiac output that is the stroke volume into heart rate and also the cardiac 
index at the same time we have understood about the stroke volume the volume of stroke volume that is 130 ml for different ventricles both the ventricles 130 ml 130 ml during each stroke and also what is tachycardia what is bradycardia okay now we shall move on to the cardiac output measurement cardiac output measurement so measurement of cardiac output in vivo in vivo means inside body that is very important we can do it with the help of some principle some particular law or we can do it with the help of some indicator volume so two ways are there either by some law or by some indicator method by some indicator method so law that we use is the fixed law so we use that is the fixed law and here indicator method we use two substances one is the dye dye normally is the methylene blue and the other is water but this is cold water or sometimes we can also do hot water depending on the situation so what we get what we do is water with a different physiological you know temperature so there are three processes one is cardiac output measurement by fixed law the second is by dye dilution this is the point number two and the third is by thermo dilution so three things first is the fixed law second is the dye dilution third is the thermo dilution so basically fixed law now we shall come to the fixed law so fixed law states us that you know the flow we can get the flow by a particular equation and that equation is consumption of a particular substance divided by concentration difference of that substance in atria or in aortic side or in i know arterial side and venous side gives us the flow so fixed law gives us a particular let me explain it again for the people who are listening to fixed law for the first time it will become a little bit different difficult so flow is determined by consumption of a substance of a particular substance so suppose we call it x divided by you know arterial concentration of x minus venous concentration of x that's the thing suppose if we take oxygen as x then consumption of oxygen flow per minute will be consumption of oxygen in one minute divided by arterial concentration of oxygen minus venous concentration of oxygen now we can measure the consumption of oxygen in one minute by making our subject run on a treadmill and inhale and exhale through a particular breathing apparatus called Douglas bag. And once we measure, the normal value comes around 250 ml per minute. Arterial concentration, the physiological value is 19 ml per, you know, 100 ml of arterial blood and venous concentration the physiological value comes 14 ml per 100 ml of you know venous blood so what we get is 250 ml divided by 5 it becomes you know 50 ml per minute approximately this become the sorry this is uh, 4 so it becomes 250 divided by 4 and in a minute it will be you know 250 divided by 4 into 60 seconds so it will approximately come around 5 liter per minute so cardiac output will be approximately 5 liter some values may you know you know sway from here and there but the exact ultimate value 5 liter per minute will come now remember there are two other methods one is the dye dilution method and in dye dilution method we use one particular dye and the dye is methylene blue what do we do we 
take the dye and we you know we give the dye to a person and that dye ultimately we you know inject the dye in the arterial side and take the dye out from the venous side particular artery that we use for dye dilution can be any artery because arterial changes are not that much but you know vein for vein we take the pulmonary artery from where dye dilution method is actually taken out so basically at the end of the dye dilution we need a particular substance that is an indicator substance and the indicator you know uh, characteristic of indicator are such one is the indicator should be non toxic second is indicator should be not metabolized and the third is indicator should have a particular assay so assay should be available assay means you know the method to examine the indicator method to calculate the blood volume of the indicator so on the basis of this actually what we get we get a time we get the initial injected value of the indicator we get the time after which the indicator is appearing back into the circulation we get the serial arterial sampling of the indicator and a and from a concentration versus time curve by extrapolating we get a area under concentration curve from where we can get the flow in a minute and flow in a minute is cardiac output so for your understanding in the first year you just have to understand that there are certain indicators which we use for understanding or calculating the cardiac output with the help of a concentration time curve indicators are those substances which we inject into the person which has to follow this this you know this three you know particulars because suppose if an indicator is toxic you give it into a person and due to its toxicity the person dies there's no point basically that is ethically wrong and we cannot that's just insane we cannot do it so we need an indicator to comply with this three guidelines three particular you know one two and three points and then we can use it and the thermodilution method where actually we so what is the difference between the thermodilution method and the dye dilution method dye dilution method and thermodilution method both are indicator methods but in thermodilution we use one thing which is very close to our body what we use we actually use cold saline thermodilution method we use is cold saline through a peripheral vein through a peripheral vein to right atrium and ultimately from a thermistor that is present inside the pulmonary artery the tip of our pulmonary artery from there we can calculate the loss of heat loss of heat with passing time and from there we can get the cardiac output so for your understanding here we use cold saline we put a thermistor in tip of pulmonary artery tip of pulmonary artery and we calculate the rate of heat loss or gain by the use of the thermistor heat loss and gain of blood and from there we calculate time and this gives us flow in a minute So flow in a minute is cardiac output. So from there we get this. So I will give you thirty seconds. Uh, take it, take the note, and we'll move on. You know, after this to blood pressure. So in the meantime, if you have any query, you can send me questions. I will try to solve. Meantime, meanwhile, you just take a note.
so what we have done so far is well um so can you please repeat first uh, five minute uh we'll do it after the break fixed law again someone has asked so fixed law is basically what is fixed law we come over here again fixed law is suppose a substance any substance that is extracted you know by blood extracted substance by blood flow is actually equivalent to flow into the difference atrio arterio venous difference of the substance so extraction suppose if you have to understand this this is the extraction of a uh, dr chaitanya and dr sharkar has asked uh, asked me about this so extraction of a substance suppose this is x by blood flow yes B means consumption of a substance extraction means why some substance will be extracted from blood or why some substance will be consumed from blood because blood will deliver them to tissue and tissue will change them tissue will use them for metabolism metabolically so the initial form of the substance will not remain all the same and the last substance last portion of the substance left over will be something different so extraction of the substance by blood flow is actually equivalent to you know the av difference av difference of substance into flow flow means volume per minute so flow from this what we get flow will be extraction divided by av difference now flow is extraction divided by difference means flow here is the cardiac output that's the fixed law now extraction how that is calculated if you go into more you know deeper so how extraction or consumption of a substance is calculated and what is the substance that we use here the substance that we use here is oxygen now how we can calculate it and when we actually consume oxygen more suppose i am an athlete and i am running on a treadmill now i am taking oxygen from the atmosphere so there i know about the point one oxygen that means initially how much is the oxygen we know from the atmospheric oxygen and then i inhale oxygen i extract oxygen all the metabolic things happen in my body with the help of the oxygen and after that carbon dioxide is exhaled now in normal situation if i run this carbon dioxide will exhale and it will be dissipated in air but for this cardiac output experiment we put a douglas bag douglas bag is just like of a mask with the particular you know blood gas analyzer connected you know it's an apparatus that is fitted over the nose and mouth of the athlete so whatever air he takes in it comes through this and whatever thing he exhale it goes into that so from there we get a proper estimation of atmospheric o2 which you know beforehand and exhaled carbon dioxide which will give us the value of exhaled or no or consumed o2 so from there we get the this one extraction value it you know av differences oxygen concentration in air, uh, artery is 19 milliliter per ml whereas oxygen concentration in vein is 14 milliliter per ml so from here which we get is the av differences so if you calculate from here we can get the flow or the volume per minute and volume per minute is the cardiac output so that's the fixed law by which we can get this remember this fixed law is different from the fixed law of diffusion that we read somewhere else which reads like a fixed law of diffusion means diffusion is you know proportional to the mm, difference between the concentration and uh, divided by the thickness increased by the uh, area that is a different thing and this fixed law is different and this fixed law gives us the cardiac output Well, I got uh, 
Dr. Jyoti Kumar, you have sent some picture over here, but I can't actually, I have to send a better picture. Uh, shadow has come over here and that is not very, uh, you know, well understood. You can send me a better picture for that. So with this, we'll move on, we'll move to blood pressure. You can send it again and I will, uh, you know, solve your query after the break. So blood pressure. What is blood pressure? Blood pressure is the perpendicular pressure, is the perpendicular pressure on the vessel. And the instrument by which we, you know, measure blood pressure is FIGMO manometer. Very important for your exam. So this is FIGMO manometer. So how many types of FIGMO manometers are there? There are three types of FIGMO manometer. One is aneroid FIGMO manometer. The second is digital spigmo manometer and the most important is mercury spigmo manometer. So spigmo manometer is the machine by which we measure blood pressure and there are aneroid, digital and mercury spigmo manometer. Now which one is what? See and what are the you know the pros and cons of each and every spigmo manometer. So first of all we think about the Aneroid spigmo manometer, that's the clock spigmo manometer. We all have seen the clock spigmo manometer that is handy and that is more or less accurate. So the good thing about the aneroid spigmo manometer is that it can be easily carried. So it can be easily carried from one part to another, one plus to another, and it doesn't contain any heavy metal. So there is not much chance of, you know, uh, heavy metal poisoning or any environmental hazard but the bad thing or a little bit con or a little bit you know um, uh, problematic thing regarding aneroid is that it's a little less accurate that is important about the aneroid spigmo manometer so most accurate spigmo manometer is the mercury spigmo manometer so mercury spigmo manometer is the most accurate but the problem is this is heavy Mercury spigmo manometer is heavy and there is also a chance of mercury poisoning that is the heavy metal poisoning. Suppose uh, you, you leave this spigmo manometer with a child and he breaks it, there's a chance of mercury vapor gets into his system and he becomes sick. So that's a heavy metal poisoning issue is present with mercury spigmo manometer. What about the digital spigmo manometer? The best thing about digital spigmo manometer, you do not require to attend this class to measure, to learn how to measure BP if you have a digital spigmo manometer. So it is easiest to use, but most confusing. So the values are not accurate. So digital spigmo manometer is the least accurate. Yes, it is handy. There is no chance of heavy metal poisoning and it can be carried easily. But the good thing about it that range of BP can be easily measured by lay person. This is very important. Lay person who doesn't know how to do anything, who doesn't know uh, how to measure BP, even he can give you a value or even a patient himself or herself can get his own value recorded but it will not be that accurate but still it can show you certain range now what is the what is the total you know circuit of a spigmo manometer that you need to know and we shall start it by you know giving you a picture of a mercury spigmo manometer so whoever uh, knows it it's fantastic people who have a little bit confusion regarding the bp measurement I will explain it for them. So I am not very, uh, you know, I am not very proud of my handwriting and uh, also not about my drawing. So don't expect a Leonardo da Vinci like, you know, thing over here. Just, just a schematic diagram I am giving over here. So this is a spigmo manometer. That's the scale of the spigmo manometer where this is the mercury reservoir, Hg reservoir and from the mercury reservoir one you know pipe or one connector comes to comes to where it comes to basically you know the cuff and from the cuff another pipe or another connector goes to the cuff that's the thing so that's all about the uh, speed move manometer uh, circuit yes i admit it's not a very beautiful picture 
but uh, it's functionally okay so this this is known as the blood pressure cuff and it is a name we call it river rocky cuff river rocky cuff and you know this one one is that this is one tubing which is connected to the mercury reservoir this is the another tubing number one and this is the tubing number two which is connected to the you know um, uh, the hand pump which is connected by a particular stopcock mechanism so that's an unidirectional valve which can you know direct or which can put air inside the cuff but can stop backflow if you screw it properly so how we actually measure blood pressure on sphygmomanometer if somebody if someone is following our class and if someone is interested i expect you to i expect you to uh, send me this uh, you know how we actually measure the blood pressure so one question that i am asking you right now that suppose we put the cuff on the arm of a patient we are just discussing about the blood pressure measurement techniques so we put the cuff on the arm of a patient so which are mostly we start with the left arm but remember all the time in your clinical practice try to measure blood pressure on both the arm to give you the comparison and to see whether there is a lot of variation between them because that will again point to certain you know uh, diseases like fluctuation of aorta or any particular severe atherosclerosis which is present on a particular side so that's a different separate issue but first we will tie up the river rocky cuff over the arm of the patient now then again one important thing is that that how we can tie how much force we should use while tying and what should be the limit locational limit of such tying so first is that we should tie the river rocky cuff two finger two finger above two finger above the anti cubital fossa mid line of the anti cubital fossa two fingers or two centimeters above it two tubings that is coming out of the river rocky cuff should come out parallel to the brachial artery and it should be such such tightly bound that only two fingers can pass through a tight cuff if if three fingers can pass through a tight cuff it is loose you have to make it tight and if one finger can only pass through it or even lesser it is tight you have to make it loose so that's a comfortable position of the river rocky cuff and after that you have to start pumping the hand pump and once you start pumping the hand pump air will move into it and air will put you know air will you know make it solen once the river rocky cuff is solen it will put pressure on the brachial artery ladies and gentlemen one important aspect you must remember here by this sphygmo manometer by this particular circuit whatever we are right now measuring is nibp this is the non invasive bp it is also known as indirect bp this is also known as indirect bp because bp blood pressure is the perpendicular pressure exerted by the flow on the vessel wall if you have to directly measure that we have to put a pressure sensor or a manometer inside the artery otherwise we cannot get it so this is indirect bp we give pressure on the artery we collapse the artery and we calculate the collapsing pressure the pressure which will neutralize the actual blood pressure we calculate that we do not put anything inside the artery by this method so this is known as non invasive bp or indirect bp is there any direct bp yes what is that called we call it in invasive bp is that actually measured yes where that is measured it is measured inside icu how we can measure it we can measure it by putting a cannula actual physical cannula inside an artery we call it arterial line placement and then we can have a particular sensitive apparatus through which we can get the arterial bp that is direct bp when we shall use that we use actually when there is heart failure there is 
diminution of BP, there is serious critical condition of the patient so that indirect BP we cannot get in all such situation or certain BP rising medication we are using in all such cases we use the direct BP. For your convenience, for first year, you just have to remember two things. One is you need to remember whatever we are doing in first year is in direct BP. There is also something called direct BP which we use when we cannot get the indirect BP in certain critical scenario. For direct BP, we have to put a cannula directly in the artery. But where we, what we are doing here, we are closing down the artery. We are getting the neutralizing pressure which closes down the artery, which actually indirectly reflects the actual BP. And that we are doing by this sphygmo manometer. Now coming back to the practical side, a little bit queries we need to understand. Remember BP understanding. Once once you are medical in, in medical curriculum, everybody, your relative, everyone, now you are locked down. So many of you, many of you are very unfortunate. Most of your relatives are coming to you for the BP measurement. So get it brushed properly. You must have to give a proper BP measurement. Otherwise you will go to your competitor, your friends, and if they get correct, you will be ridiculed. So to save yourself from ridicules and all these things, learn it properly. The second thing which I have seen, most of the students don't have a proper idea how much should we pump. Some says 150 millimeter of mercury, some says 180 millimeter of mercury. Okay, I take, uh, okay, I take your 150 millimeter of mercury. If I take your 150 millimeter of mercury, if a patient has 200 millimeter of mercury, can I measure the BP? I cannot measure the BP. So we need certain particular landmark or reference range which we require when we are measuring BP. Here comes to the next point that there are various ways by which we can measure BP. One is the pathopatary method, the other is the auscultatory method. This one you need to remember. One is palpatory method, the other is the auscultatory method. What is palpatory method? So, students, most of you know, but at the same time, do what I am preaching right now. Take your three fingers of right hand and put it on your radial pulse. Try to feel the radial pulse. I hope that you have been through a practical exam or practical classes in your college. Just for the recapitulation, put three of your fingers on the radial pulse and try to feel the radial pulse. Now, you have tied up the BP cuff on your patient and now at the same time you are pumping the BP cuff. You continue to pump the BP cuff at the same time try to palpate the radial pulse. The moment when BP cuff pressure will be equal to the pressure in the brachial artery, flow in brachial artery will be stopped because equal pressure is occluding the brachial artery. Now radial artery is the continuation of brachial artery in this tel you know, distal upper limb. So what will happen? If the brachial artery is occluded, there will be no more flow in brachial artery and subsequently in radial artery. So the radial pulse will no more be felt. So now we have come to a particular position where we have pumped, pumped so much that radial pulse is just not felt. From this point, we'll move another 20 millimeter of mercury above. So we'll keep on pumping for another 20 millimeter of mercury and after that we'll deflate the screw, we'll unscrew the stopcock so that there will be a fall in pressure. Now this fall in pressure is also regulated. It is, it should be slow and the rate of fall in pressure is 2 millimeter per second. Remember, don't get too much bopped up because 2 millimeter per second, none of us, we have seen a lot of patients, we have seen thousands of patients, we have never gone for this calculation of 2 millimeter per second. Just try to go slow and in a an harmonious and regular way, just deflate it slowly and subtly so that slowly the mercury column comes down and a time comes when deflated cuff pressure is just, just below the pressure of brachial artery. At that moment, there will be starting or beginning of blood flow, which will lead to beginning of palpation or beginning of, you know, pulsation at the radial artery. So that point will be the systolic blood pressure by palpatory method. Just 
for your understanding we can take it as 130 millimeter of mercury let me explain it again that you are pumping you are palpating the radial artery and around 130 millimeter of mercury radial pulse gun you keep up pumping for another 20 millimeter of mercury once you reach the arbitrary value of 150 millimeter of mercury you just deflate it slowly regularly so that the uh, mercury column comes down once the mercury column comes down approximately around 130 millimeter of mercury again the non-invasive pressure on brachial artery will be equal or slightly lesser than the actual brachial artery pressure so that will start the flow begin the flow and once the flow is big flow has begun the radial pulsation will also start so we'll get the radial pulse again and that point is the systolic blood pressure by palpatory method so remember for classical type of measurement always if you are asked in exam about you know you measure the blood pressure always first attempt the palpatory method once you do the palpatory method you know about the 130 millimeter of mercury the sbp now you know now we will go for the auscultatory method what is auscultatory method? It is the method by stethoscope. Now you take your stethoscope out and you have already tied it and it is zero. The blood pressure is zero. Now you know the systolic blood pressure is 130. So you know the value. Now you straight go 20 plus systolic. So you keep on pumping, go up to 150 millimeter of mercury and then start deflating. Once you start deflating, there what will happen slowly slowly at the rate of two millimeter per second mercury column will fall down and approximately around the systolic blood pressure that means 130 millimeter of mercury there will be a sound and this sound is known as the korotkov sound as the sound is the first sound we call it the first korotkov sound so first korotkov sound signifies the systolic blood pressure by auscultatory method. You keep on deflating, the character of sound will change. It will continuously from a loud, from a tapping to loud to gong to, it will go into a muffled variety of sound and a time will come when, remember, characters of sound will change and a time will come when there will be disappearance of sound there will be disappearance of sound this is the point the point of disappearance will be the diastolic blood pressure systolic blood pressure is the maximum blood pressure that is recorded during systole and diastolic blood pressure is the lowest blood pressure that is measured during diastole so we will get the diastolic blood pressure when there will be disappearance of sound so for your explain why questions you need to understand few things if i ask you one question let me see how many of you can answer this suppose this question quickly take your chat box i am asking one question that you need to ask, explain if i put a stethoscope on the brachial artery right now you see i don't have any anything tied up on my brachial artery if i put any stethoscope on the brachial artery will there be any sound i shall be waiting for 30 seconds for your answer will there be any sound Waiting for your answer. Quickly send. Once again, let me let me explain if there if I put a stethoscope on an untied vessel in body, anywhere it may be, will there be any sign? Yes, Dr. Fatima, you are correct. There will be no sound. Yes, most of you, Dr. Kirti, Dr. Amalia. Yes, no sound. Why? Okay, okay, I got it. Somebody said yes. I, I, I will not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, many of you are yes. I, I, I will not disclose your name. Yes, yes. Uh, no, I will not disclose your name. But uh, Dr. Amelia, Dr. Fatima, Dr. Uh, Sai Kirti, Dr. Hina Kosar, Dr. Krishna Chaitanya, all of you are correct. Why? Now the next question comes to why. The people who have uh, written, yes, I am not disclosing your name, but remember you were wrong. The answer is no. Why? Now the next question is why? Dr. Shuprita told, no sounds are hard, sir. Thank you. But what is the, what is the reason? Why no sounds are hard? What is the reason? 
नो आई नो डॉक्टर सरकार डॉक्टर विष्णु देश पंडे एवरीबॉडी वी नो 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 वी नो बट वाई नो लेट अस नो दैट एनी आई विल अगेन गिव यू ट्वेंटी टू थर्टी सेकेंड्स टू सी वेदर यू नो वाई देर इज नो साउंड ऑन एन अनटाइड आइटम आई शैल बी वेटिंग ट्वेंटी टू थर्टी सेकेंड्स लेट सी still people are sending no 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 like that i i request the reason why no why no time is running away quickly quickly send me the answer why no 20000 people are watching this show if you can send the right answer you will be famous send me why there is no sound still because yes dr sharkar is correct dr devrath sharkar is the first person who has responded and he has talked about the turbulence of the flow yes he is correct dr sharkar he is correct and this turbulence of the flow it depends yes but the other people are a little bit later they have answered dr sharkar is the winner today anyway so there are two types of flow nothing nothing winning or learning it's all about learning it's nothing about winning or losing but uh, i really do appreciate dr sharkar at the same time uh, uh, somebody said uh, maybe due to absence of pressure on the artery sir which is not correct dhiraj um, varma dr dhiraj varma dr siram dhiraj varma is also correct he is also correct no turbulent flow uh, someone said that because it is not palpitatory superficially no it's not correct it's not correct i'm not disclosing your name okay enough of this game we are coming back to the class so there are two types of flow one is the laminar flow and the turbulent flow and laminar flow and turbulent flow laminar means a gentle flow turbulent flow you think about a you know pipe a garden hose pipe and through the garden hose pipe you, i think you know you are watering the plants now if you do one thing if you just squeeze the garden hose pipe what will happen look at the picture suppose this is the garden hose pipe okay and through the garden hose pipe in initially flow is flow of water is moving from suppose point a to point b now you squeeze this garden hose pipe suppose now once you squeeze the garden hose pipe you squeeze and you create this kind of thing you squeeze it you squeeze it so it becomes like this once you squeeze it what will happen the midline flow can pass through once you squeeze it because the lumen will be narrowed and this peripheral flow will go back they have to reflect because they don't have any place to go but remember heart is a continuous pump so second level of fluid will come second level of fluid will kick it as the second level of fluid will kick it so there will be lot of turbulence lot of meeting of angry flow over this zone and you can also feel that particular sensation at your fingers and that sensation is called turbulence lot of angry bubbling flow inside the you know the tube this is called turbulence now whether a particular flow will be turbulent or not by physics we can know about that and that we can know by a particular number we call it reynolds number we call it reynolds number and reynolds number gives us a particular value of um, you know whether it will be turbulent or not it is rho dv by eta reynolds number is rho dv by eta where you know rho dv by eta where it gives us the viscosity the specific gravity the diameter of the vessel and the flow all of this determines whether if a particular flow will be laminar or turbulent if rho dv by eta is more than 3000 the flow will be turbulent if rho dv by eta is less than 2000 the flow will be laminar i will i will make it uh, you know i will zoom in properly so 
rho dv by eta the reynolds number if it is more than 3000 the flow will be turbulent if less than 2000 the flow will be laminar and 2000 to 3000 the flow will be intermediate so that is the thing you need to know about this okay so well if you have any query you can send it to me i'm also giving you some time to recapitulate a little bit Dr. Sharkar has asked me something regarding the cardiac and skeletal muscle, uh, the passive and active length tension. But remember, this uh, we shall discuss, but it is already we have crossed this part. And skeletal muscle is a separate thing we have started from cardiology. So, this is a power topic from uh, you know the nerve muscle physiology. Once you get into the nerve muscle physiology, we will discuss about it. But if we start discussing about it, in that case, you know, um, we will just get away from our today's topic so basically we will pick it up later and anyone else any other query query uh, specific to today's class yes uh, see opening snap and extra ejection clicks and all these at the part um, exactly see opening snaps it occurs in case of you know whenever the mitral valve gets open that at that time the opening snap occurs this is the valvular physiology uh, this you will again learn in the time when you get into the medicine uh, in the first year it is a slightly out of your syllabus i will discuss all this once if we get time after finishing the actual physiology if we get time to discuss the clinical physiology or also you can join the neat pg um, explanation um, uh, tutorial where i shall discuss about the opening snap murmur and the um, ejection clicks so basically uh, if we use precious time over here regarding this we'll lose our time but you can i i, I will invite you to our uh, neat pg and fmg classes where we shall discuss all this opening snap extra uh, ejection cliques murmur flow murmur valvular murmur everything i shall discuss over there everything else okay so now we shall move into other topics regarding the blood pressure so first is the systolic blood pressure that's the major that the maximum blood pressure we uh, get during um, the height of systole and we have the diastolic blood pressure dbp that we get during you know uh, the lowest trough of um, or nadir of diastole now one more important thing suppose if we take systolic blood pressure is 120 millimeter per mercury uh, millimeter of mercury and diastolic blood pressure is 80 millimeter of mercury then there are certain parameters we need to know that one parameter is pulse pressure this is very important pulse pressure is actually equal to systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure that means it is 120 minus 80 millimeter of mercury that is the 40 millimeter of mercury always remember most of the time when we ask a student about what is the normal blood pressure you say 120 by 80 but remember it's not 120 by 80 the blood pressure is in a range a person who is having 110 by 70 is having normal tension normal pressure a person having 136 by 82 normal pressure there are certain ranges like 140 by 90 if we cross that we will call that you are in the hypertensive range and this also changes year by year as per the protocol for your first year knowledge you need to know that anything below 140 and below 90 diastolic below 140 systolic and below 90 diastolic we can term it as a normal blood pressure anything above 100 millimeter of mercury systolic and 60 millimeter of mercury diastolic or 70 millimeter of mercury diastolic you can call it the you know normal 
diastolic blood pressure. Pulse pressure is the difference. And now very important thing that comes, that is the mean arterial pressure. Now, now this will be my question to all of you. Do you know mean arterial pressure? So you quickly send me the mathematical expression of mean arterial pressure in 30 seconds. I shall be waiting and then I shall explain it. Anyone knowing mean arterial pressure? Dr. Yogita asked me why turbulent flow is not heard by stethoscope. No, turbulent flow is heard by stethoscope because of the turbulence. If there is turbulence, there will be extra sound generated. There will be noise that is heard by stethoscope. Remember, Korotkov sounds are actually turbulent sound that is heard by the stethoscope. At the end of diastolic blood pressure, this turbulence is just over because by that time the flow is decreased, the diameter has increased. So the turbulence has just over. As the turbulence has just over, so we that cannot be hard so laminar flow is not hard by stethoscope turbulent flow is hard by stethoscope no that's wrong svp plus one third of dbp is wrong yes that is krishna chaitanya is correct diastolic plus one third pulse pressure easiest way to remember easiest way to remember two classes back most probably in the second week of May when we started taking classes, I told you one thing. Atrial systole is from 0 0.1 second. Atrial diastole is for 0 0.7 second. Ventricular systole is for 0 0.3 second. Ventricular diastole is for 0 0.5 second. So any particular observation that you can find over here? The observation is diastole is longer than systole. Means the CVS cardiovascular system is more in diastole than in systole. So simple way by which I can remember, I think, I hope you can also remember that mean arterial pressure is one third of systolic blood pressure plus two third of DBP diastolic blood pressure. Just remember this. Now you know PP means, uh, that means the pulse pressure means SBP minus DBP. You put it over here, you all have passed class 12, you all know maths better than me. So diastolic blood pressure, one third of pulse pressure, you do your way. No issue with that. But the basic is one third of SBP plus two third of DBP. You will be made full many times by the examiner with the simple equation. Remember, heart is more in diastole. So in MAP, mean arterial pressure, diastole is given more preference. One third of SBP, two third of diastolic blood pressure. That's it. Remember. Now important is, what is the normal value of mean arterial pressure? There are discrepancies, but remember, what is the basic idea of mean arterial pressure? What is the benefit of calculating mean arterial pressure? See, mean arterial pressure gives us the value of tissue perfusion or organ perfusion. If mean arterial pressure is okay, the tissue perfusion will be okay and blood pressure basically see this is the blood vessel and we have the tissue over here if the blood pressure which is the perpendicular pressure is more what will happen blood will move oxygen will move metabolites will move more into the tissue so mean arterial pressure if that is more that means the average blood pressure on a temporal axis on the basis of the cardiac cycle in whole spectrum of cardiac cycle that's the mean arterial pressure so average of blood pressure and time standardized that is the mean arterial pressure if that is more the flow inside the tissue will be more so that will give us the tissue perfusion you know quality now mean arterial pressure that normal is more than 65 millimeter of mercury in critical care where we have to deal with life and death we have to deal with organ perfusion tissue perfusion in critically ill patient mean arterial pressure is extremely important if mean arterial pressure falls below a particular value in that case what will happen? The tissue perfusion or the organ perfusion will fall down. So, you know, the main arteries, main organs like kidney, like brain, they will not get the blood flow, which will ultimately lead to multi-organ dysfunction. So, this is one important factor you need to remember. Okay. So, after this, 
we will also come to another factor which is extremely important that is the cup size see some some subjects some patients will be thin some patient will be thick so if you use the same cuff on all of them you will get a wrong thing like you have an adult cuff and a pediatric patient a child has come to you and you have put that adult cuff on the patient so you'll get a wrong value so just take home tip for you if you use a small cuff this is very important if you use a small cuff you will get a false high value if you use a large cuff you will get a false low value that's it so small cuff false high value large cuff false low value just remember this so a child on a child who is an adult cuff you get a blood vessel blood value blood pressure value which is actually lower than the actual value this one you remember all through till your entrance pg entrance or other exam through your uh, professional exams also and for your viva too okay so uh, with this we are taking a break over here and after break we'll come back with your course a lot of difficult uh, things are there but a few things you need to understand that left ventricle has thicker you know wall whereas the right ventricle has thinner wall so left ventricle is seven times thicker than the right ventricle so the thing is different and left ventricle outflow that means left ventricle pumps and then the blood will go into the aortic zone so left ventricle outflow goes into the aorta which is a part of systemic circulation which is a higher pressure 120 by 80 that's the mean pressure average pressure over there on the other side on the right side right ventricle has a thinner wall but it flows the outflow in the pulmonary circuit which has a much lower flow approximately you know 25 by 5 or 20 by 5 approximately so even after the fiber thickness is less in case of right ventricle as it moves into as it vomits into lower flow you know system so right ventricle can also you know push more blood right ventricle can also eject more volume of blood now you see uh, another question that has come to me as the uh, dr sai kirti she has asked about um, normal range of bp so there is absolutely no normal range of bp what we have some abnormal range of bp if we have more than 140 by 90 so we can call it which a term it as something and if it is more than 150 by 95 we, if it is more than 160 by 100 like that so approximately physiologically you can get a wide variability of bp in village people in india we most of the time we can also uh, you know get in a huge population sometimes we get 90 by 60 bp which is absolutely fine in them so bp normally you know anything below 140 by 90 and anything above 90 by 60 including these two values we can call it normal that's the normal range okay but you have to check with other parameters you have to individualize so what is normal for mr a may not be normal for mr b so that is high there is highly clinical high clinical variability in bp so uh, that's the normal range but for our benefit for our understanding we take 120 by 80 why one third of sbp and two third of dbp exactly you see mean arterial pressure it for this every moment at every moment you have to take a mean and by the help of calculus we have to calculate the mean arterial pressure one third of BB, sbp and two third of dbp is the easiest way to remember because because systole systole time total systole time is less total diastole time is more basically so one third of sbp and two third of dbp from there we can get this any any further question we uh, first five minute of today first five minute of today actually uh, dr uh, dr chaitanya asked uh, me about the first five minute the, in the first five minute let us just take a little bit of time it was the first five minute where i discussed so this was the cardiac action potential of working myocardial cell up to this sorry uh, suppose i'm talking like this okay let's see this is the 
working myocardial cell cardiac action potential and up to this this is the absolute refractory period so this much is the absolute refractory period and this onwards that means this zone is the relative refractory period this zone is the relative refractory period relative refractory period is the supranormal period this zone is the supranormal period when less than threshold that means sub threshold stimuli if you use there will be generation of a second ap so sub threshold stimuli can generate a second ap and sometimes this that's why this zone is responsible for triggered activity this zone is responsible for excessive automaticity and this zone can lead to this zone can lead to generation of arrhythmia rhythm disturbances and most common arrhythmia that happens in this zone is the r on t phenomenon r on t phenomenon that's an ECG term and for remembrance you can say that this is the ventricular tachycardia that can generate the most common arrhythmia due to the r on t phenomenon which can occur in the relative refractory period for this much you need not understand for you first prof you just understand the relative refractory period it is a supranormal period at this time you can see uh, even even a slightly lesser than threshold the because because you see it's still suppose this this zone or this zone it is still above the rmp so the threshold it is still closer to the threshold so a lesser amount of uh, stimuli can generate can help it cross the threshold so lesser amount and it's in the relative refractory period so lesser amount of stimuli can also generate a second ap over here that's all so there's a that's the first five minutes of today now we are coming to the cardiac regulation this is extremely important cardiac regulation so first of all we shall urge you to write how we actually move on and after that we shall explain important parts from cardiac regulation so there are different different parts or types of cardiac regulation one is short term regulation the other is intermediate regulation and the other is the long term regulation so some of it you know short term regulation intermediate regulation and the long term regulation in the short term there will be baroreceptor welcome to it there will be chemoreceptor but remember chemoreceptor is more important for the respiratory system and we also have cns ischemic response cns ischemic response then we have intermediate re uh, regulation where we can get capillary fluid shift capillary fluid shift we can have stress and relaxation And we have long term response, which is due to renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And we, we can have renal fluid shift mechanism or renal fluid handling mechanism. So, these are the three things. So, I will urge you to take the note of three system um, let me make it a little bit more into focus so these three parts once again let me enumerate one is short term the second is intermediate term and the third is the long term mechanism the short term mechanism is the baroreceptor mechanism the, the chemoreceptor mechanism and the CNS ischemic response whereas the intermediate term is capillary fluid shift and stress relaxation and the long term is renin angiotensin aldosterone system and renal fluid handling mechanism so these are the few terms basically so among all this some of the topics for your first prof or for your university exam some of the topics you need to understand very well 
and some of the topics you need to have an overall view while writing some topics you have to write in a very intrinsic depth and some topic you can just give an overview and some of these like baroreceptor chemoreceptor ras they can come as short note whereas others you just have to have an you know superficial knowledge so let me see whether any question has come Okay, no new question regarding this topic. So we'll move into our discussion, short-term regulation first. Short-term regulation. So first is the baroreceptor. What is baroreceptor? Baroreceptor are the pressure sensor. Pressure sensor baroreceptor so what what it can baro means pressure receptor is the pressure sensor and the pressure sensor in the baroreceptors are the glomus cell type 1 glomus cell we'll we'll come to that later so where they are actually located so what are the baroreceptors their carotid body which is located at the bifurcation of common carotid artery at the beginning of IC internal carotid artery there at tunica adventitia where the receptor is present the other is aortic arch where is this present aortic arch is present at the arch of aorta Again at the tunica adventitia, so at the arch of aorta. So what they can sense? They have glomus cell, and they can sense can sense blood pressure. They can sense blood pressure. Now they are connected. They are, they, they they can initiate a reflex. They can initiate a reflex, and a reflex means. It will have afferent, it will have center, it will have efferent. So here the reflex afferents are 9 and 10 cranial nerves. Center is the vasomotor center in the brain stream. And also the efferent is 9 and 10 cranial nerve plus sympathetic chain. So that's the thing. 9 and 10 means glossopharyngeal and vagus. Center, vasomotor center that is present in brain stem. So this way, just I am giving you a proper complete, you know, visual. So just take it down and we shall explain it after this. So we are talking about, for the people who have joined a little later after the break we are talking about blood pressure regulation or cvs regulation both are the same almost now we are talking about the short term intermediate term and long term in the short term there is the first most important is the baroreceptor and remember also one more point is that these baroreceptors we are talking about are the high pressure baroreceptor these are the high pressure baroreceptor there are also low pressure baroreceptor or volume sensor will come later okay so afferent efferent everything now what is the pathway so we'll go to the pathway of the baroreceptor so suppose the baroreceptors are here and they can sense the bp so they are in the aortic arch and carotid body this baroreceptor will be taken by 9 and 10 and they will go to nucleus tractus solitarius nucleus tractus solitarius it is present in the brain stem nts which is actually a nucleus of a lot of cranial nerve nuclei now nucleus 
tractor solitarius will directly come to two zones one is cvlm caudal ventrolateral medulla and the other is cic cardio inhibitory center caudal ventrolateral medulla and the other is cardio inhibitory center now this caudal ventrolateral medulla can act on rvlm caudal ventrolateral medulla act on rostral ventrolateral medulla that act on iml intermediolateral gray intermediolateral gray and that act on sympathetic chain which has its action on heart and vessel i will I, I will make it under focus i will take it under focus and this cic acts on parasympathetic chain and that has its action on heart and vessel now you can first write this what you can see on the picture first you write this so in the picture we can see the baroreceptor which starts from the aortic arch and the carotid body the efferin goes by ninth nerve and tenth nerve to the nucleus tractor solitarius now nucleus tractor suppose the pressure is high so what will happen nucleus tractor solitarius will understand the pressure is high because the excess signal is coming from the baroreceptor now nucleus tractor solitarius when the pressure is high it will do one thing it will stimulate the cardio inhibitory center now cardio inhibitory center will increase the parasympathetic system and the parasympathetic system will decrease the heart and vessel activity that means it will cause decreased heart rate it will cause less contraction of blood vessel so ultimately there will be bradycardia and you know the hypotension this too will act at the same time intermediolateral gray this acts on sympathetic this actually acts on heart so it increases heart rate and vascular contraction nts will act on cvlm but cvlm will basically inhibit the rvlm and rvlm will actually it causes activation of iml so if rvlm is inhibited so the whole process down the line whole process down the line will be inhibited and then nothing like this will be possible nothing like this will be possible so ultimately increase in heart rate and vessel contraction will not be there so there will be no higher rate and no hypertension so ultimately heart rate and blood pressure will come down that's the whole thing let me explain it again baroreceptor they are present in carotid uh, you know body and aortic arch and these are high pressure baroreceptor they can sense increase in pressure when bp is increased baroreceptor fire extra signals this extra signal will be carried by 9th and 10th nerve it will come to nucleus tractus solitarius extra signal will you know excite the nucleus tractus solitarius it will excite cvlm and cic now cic once excited it is directly connected via parasympathetic fiber to heart and vessel so parasympathetic will be on they will be stimulated it will re, you know it will give rise to decreased heart rate and decreased vascular contraction whereas cvlm once it is stimulated it is it will in directly inhibit the rvlm as rvlm is inhibited so iml and subsequent sympathetic system which was under direct excitatory pathway from rvlm will be inhibited and ultimately excitatory pathway to heart and vessel will be inhibited which will lead to decrease in heart rate and vascular contractility so i will urge all of you to just take a note of all this and also send me some question let me see if any question has come
Anybody for any question here? In RVLM will be inhibited by CVLM. The in case of BP, Dr. Chaitanya, yes. Dr. Deshpande, yes. So uh, RVLM will be inhibited. Suppose the whole thing is opposite, the whole process will be opposite basically. So baroreceptor, if there is no, see, some of the things here. Now you have to understand one concept here. That is the tonic stimulation. Tonic stimulation means, think of, you know, it 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 will be a little bit clumsy example, but think of the tail of a dog. The tonic stimulation, the tonic condition of tail of a dog, it is curved. So that's a natural condition. Similarly, RVLM is tonically discharging. IML tonically discharges. Sympathetic system tonically discharges. So you need a switch to switch it off. To switch it off, we need CVLM to fire up. That's the thing. If no firing comes from CVLM, the whole system, sympathetic system, is already tonically discharging. If you don't, if you don't bend the tail of a dog to its original position, it will always remain curved. That's the thing. So, Dr. Chaitanya, Dr. Deshpande, uh, I think you have got your answer. That's a tonical discharge concept. And in case of hypotension, just the opposite will occur. Understand? Now, after this, we'll come to the chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptor. <coughs> Excuse me. What is chemoreceptor? Same. Carotid body, aortic arch. But remember, chemoreceptor, the influence of chemoreceptor is more seen in respiratory system. Not here, but still I shall explain a little bit of chemoreceptor because it is there in the syllabus in all your textbooks, chemoreceptor are mentioned over here. That's why just a little bit I shall explain. So there are two types of chemoreceptor. One is the peripheral chemoreceptor. The other is the central chemoreceptor. Peripheral chemoreceptors are the carotid body and the aortic arch. Whereas the central chemoreceptors are present in brain, near medulla, at the floor of fourth ventricle. This is not heart ventricle, this is the brain ventricle. At the level of fourth ventricle. Peripheral chemoreceptor, they are sensitive to hypoxia. This is very important. Very important. They are sensitive to hypoxia. Whereas central chemoreceptor, sensitive to Concentration of H plus means the pH basically. Concentration of H plus means that is proportional to pH because pH is the negative logarithm of the same thing. So in brain fluid, brain fluid means brain fluid means CSF. Brain fluid mean means brain interstitial fluid. So there, these are the central chemoreceptor and peripheral chemoreceptor. Remember, in case of hypoxia, there will be also there will be less tissue perfusion, which can lead to acidosis. So hypoxia will stimulate this one. At the same time, acidosis will stimulate this one. So in this way, indirect influences of chemoreceptor will be on blood pressure and cardiovascular um, uh, system. But remember, though indirect, this is very very vital. But not more than this you need to write if you are writing a question from CVS. Just the understanding, the examiner wants to see whether you understand whether there is some chemoreceptor, what are the names of those chemoreceptor at the same time, whether do you know that how chemoreceptor has some kind of influence on the cardiac system. Now after this, we'll move on to the next part. And the next part is the CNS ischemic reflex. This is the CNS ischemic reflex. That is a short term point number three CNS ischemic response or CNS ischemic reflex. This is also known as Cushing reflex. Cushing reflex. This is also known as Cushing reflex. Yes. Now I think you can see. 
now I think you can see yeah cosine reflex so what happens see suppose there is increased BP or increased intracranial pressure intracranial pressure so increased intracranial pressure will lead to collapse of cerebral artery Cerebral artery is collapse. So try to understand brain, our skull, it has limited volume. And whatever inside is non-compressible. So if there is something, some tumor, some injury, something that is there which should not be there, that will increase the intracranial pressure. That will increase the pressure inside brain. Now, if suppose it has a finite volume and there is something extra, something extra. So what will happen? It will compress the naturally occurring things because there is no extra space. There is no compressibility. So ultimately it will lead to collapse of cerebral, cerebral arteries. Now collapse of cerebral arteries definitely means less blood flow. Less blood flow means decreased PO2 and increased PCO2, high hypoxia and hypercapnia. Now decreased PO2 and increased PCO2 is actually that stimulates the vasomotor center. That means the NTS. Vasomotor center is the NTS. Vasomotor center actually it's the conglomerate of CVLM plus CIC. Once that happens, vasomotor center, suppose CVLM and CIC, when they are stimulated, they will, when they are stimulated, they will lead to increase in blood pressure when blood pressure is increased that will lead to reflex bradycardia that will lead to reflex bradycardia try to understand if pressure is increased you need less heart rate to generate the same cardiac output which will lead to Cushing triad which will lead to Cushing triad. And there are three parts of Cushing triad. One is bradycardia. Second is increased BP. And third is decreased respiratory rate. That is due to direct collapse of supply to respiratory center. So these are the part of Cushing triad or the CNS systemic response. So all this actually started with increased intracranial pressure leading to decreased flow. Decreased flow leads to accumulation of substances which causes hypoxia and hypercapnia which actually stimulates the vasomotor center that means CVLM and CIC which will lead to basically the blood, increase in blood pressure ultimately there will be reflex bradycardia and reflex bradycardia will lead to Cushing triad. Cushing triad has three parts one is bradycardia the second is increased BP and the third is the respiratory rate decrease in the respiratory rate. After this there are certain uh, you know there are certain reflexes that you need to understand the first reflex is the Bainbridge reflex then there is basal gyrus reflex we will come one after another the Bainbridge reflex was basically deno you know discovered in back in 1860 and it was discovered like that infusion of saline suppose infusion of saline or water a blood into the right atria of dog it was done in an experimental animal infusion of saline in the right atria of dog that will lead to increase in heart rate so that is the Benbridge reflex remember so far what we have discussed that baroreceptor the high pressure baroreceptor carotid body aortic body here something is different here we are discussing about the low pressure baroreceptor of the volumes and so I will come to that now so what happens if you infuse saline infusion will lead to increase in right atrium volume 
right atrial volume if that is increased that will lead to right atrial stretch right atrial stretch see that will lead to right atrial stretch now right atrial stretch will lead to stimulation of stimulation of low pressure baroreceptors low pressure baroreceptors low pressure baroreceptors once they are stimulated they will act on the vagal afferents they will go to brain stem and they will inhibit the cic once the cic is inhibited that means there will be inhibition of parasympathetic outflow once the parasympathetic outflow is inhibited there will be increased heart rate so this we see in case of vein bridge reflex so whenever we infuse a patient with some fluid we will find there will be a reflex tachycardia we infuse i mean with fluid a person with fluid there will be increased i mean there will be tachycardia increased heart rate there is another thing i will i'll give you some time to take a note of it you can take a note of it meanwhile we'll see whether there is any question Any new question? I shall be waiting. CIC. What is the full form of CIC? CIC. Dr. Varma has asked. CIC full form is the cardio inhibitory center. That is the chief center or the mother center of parasympathetic. CVLM, the caudal ventrolateral medulla that goes via RVLM, rostral ventrolateral medulla to the sympathetic center, basically. So this is all about the basal gyrus reflex. We'll move on to the I am sorry, this is all about the Benbridge reflex. We will move on to the basal gyrics. Basal gyrus is the coronary chemo reflex. Basal gyrus is the coronary chemo reflex. So it is stimulated by non capsulated stimulated by non capsulated c fiber of vagus nerve so basically due to and it is stimulated by some chemical substances by some chemical substances if injected into coronary arteries chemical substances like you know like capsaicin or certain substances in 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 uh, you know clinical scenario we can find basal gyrus reflex to be uh, activated during the coronary angiography the dye angiographic dye can uh, do this basically that will lead to certain changes autonomic in autonomic nervous system so they have their on action on autonomic nervous system which will ultimately lead to decrease in heart rate and decrease in bp as this basal gyrus reflex inhibits the sympathetic system 
and excites the parasympathetic system by stimulating the VMC vasomotor center so and also there will be coronary artery vasodilation and coronary artery vasodilation is also due to due to you know inhibition of sympathetic system because sympathetic system will cause the constriction of vascular muscle constriction or contraction of vascular smooth muscle if this vascular smooth muscle are you know dilated not contracted so there will be vasodilation so once again let me tell you about the visual jerry's reflex this is the coronary camo reflex this is due to the this the afferent is c fiber of vagus nerve and it basically goes to the vmc stimulates vmc to inhibit sympathetic nervous system and to excite the parasympathetic nervous system so if you if you just in you know if infuse with particular chemicals into the coronary artery like capsaicin the autonomic nervous system will change that means sympathetic will be down parasympathetic will be up and it will lead to hypotension it will lead to bradycardia it will lead to coronary artery vasodilation so that is all about this visual jerry's reflex so we have very sh short amount of time today and very quickly we shall explain one thing as some of the students i can see they have yes they have asked me to discuss the basic structure of ecg and the basic rhythm so we have actually completed the short term thing we have to complete the long-term regulation of blood pressure and CVS which we will do in the next week but we have very short time right now and we will just complete as per request the basic rhythms of ECG if you wish we can also have a detailed class on ECG but that we will do later basic rhythms of ECG that we shall just do right now so if we look at the lead to ECG it is like this you can see and there are few waves like P, Q, R, S, T. This you need to remember. So it is the lead to ECG. In other leads, this is the lead to ECG. In other leads, it can look a little different. Like R wave can be negative in some leads. P wave can be negative in some leads. If you look at AVR, lead AVR, which is just opposite to lead 2, like AVR is on your right shoulder, whereas lead 2 is on, on your left feet. So if you look like that, in that case, everything will just be opposite. P will be negative, R will be negative. One more point I need to remember, uh, I need to ask you, I need to tell you that whenever there is an upward deflection of EC on ECG, we call it positive wave and whenever there is a downward deflection on ECG we call it negative wave so anyway so what are the types of wave what are the what are the reasons why the waves are formed I will ask this is a P wave that is due to atrial depolarization anybody who can tell me about what is PR over here or PQ I will I uh, this is very li little time i will ask anybody who can tell me about pr or pq segment you can you can tell me over here shall be waiting q wave is for septal depolarization q wave is for septal depolarization r wave R wave is for ventricular depolarization. Remember this QRS hole is ventricular depolarization. Very good. Dr. Shorkar has just asked us told that this is due to internodal delay. Basically, PQ, like the beginning of P, we were at the QRS basically that is due to the ventricular repolarization and then there is a ST interval this ST interval which is present over here and this ST interval is the isoelectric period is the isoelectric period and this isoelectric period when it is just the end of ventricular depolarization and no ventricular tissue is there present for further depolarization and after that what we get is the T wave which is due to 
the ventricular repolarization ventricular repolarization so you may ask me where is the atrial repolarization atrial repolarization falls somewhere here so that's why it is masked by the ventricular depolarization and we cannot see any positive waves over here now if we look at how the ecg is actually formed and what is that lead to ecg we'll just give you an overview over here from where we shall start in the next class so in the next class we will go in the long term regulation of blood pressure and overview of ecg that will be our next class and a little bit of hemodynamics and after that we can say that our you know cvs is almost done so next class you come with your uh, questions you can also send me question in the live chat section throughout the week and after that i will choose some most relevant week questions and we can discuss the university exam papers and in and your queries which are relevant in the next class so basically if we look at the heart you see if we look at the heart and it looks like this It looks like this and this is the SA note this is the you know the AV note bundle of A's and Purkinje fibers from here and if we look at the ECG lead this ECG lead to will be looking at heart from here from lead to where it is written and the opposite side of this there will get the AVR where it is written. So this is the difference between these two. Now we see P wave, which is a depolarizing wave. When when it is formed, when there is atrial depolarization, means there is depolarization in sinus node. So the vectors of depolarization of sinus node will look like this, and this depolarization will have a small vector which will look like towards the left below towards the left and below and this will look like this so the small vector will look towards lead 2 so it will give rise to a small upward upward deflection remember vector coming to a lead vector coming to a lead will give upward deflection or positive deflection upward deflection or positive deflection vector going away will give negative deflection or downward deflection so once this happens after that it comes to av node it comes to av node so one answer which i got a little while ago what is the basic of pq interval or pn interval that is also an isoelectric period remember someone has told me that this is due to internodal internodal conduction it's not due to internodal conduction it is due to av nodal delay as things come to av node it stops for some time as it stops for some time there is this isoelectric period why it stops for some time last day i have discussed it stops there because av node has very very limited number of gap junctions and therefore all the things that come all the you know impulses that come to av node they will stop there for some time before it moves further distally to the bundle of keys once it reaches bundle of his and further down it actually depolarized septum from left to right I, I think you can see a depolarized septum from left to right and if you take the resultant vector of all these septum is a smaller structure compared to ventricle but a larger structure compared to atria and the resultant of vector will look back towards the right upper part and it will still be a you know since septum is a smaller structure compared to you know ventricle so it will still be a small vector so therefore one vector you see this one vector that is going away from the lead to that means it will prove it will create a negative deflection and that is the q wave which will be formed over here after that what will happen after this whole you know after this whole of the ventricle whole of the ventricle 
apex and then whole of the ventricle will be depolarized once whole of the ventricle is depolarized the dip vector will be like this it will be a bigger vector why it will be a bigger vector because ventricle has a huge mass compared to atria and compared to you know septum and as the maximum part of ventricle is being depolarized it will be a bigger vector coming towards lead to so it will lead to a bigger wave which is also positive so it will lead to r wave after that after this the last part of the ventricle remains to be depolarized and that is the base of heart and near the annulus so all the yellow yellow demarcated part that will be the last part to be you know depolarized and let me give you an idea of this depolarization this depolarization happens like this this depolarization vectors happens like this so the ultimate vector of depolarization here it will look like this it will look like this it is a positive depolarization vector here it is a positive depolarization vector moving away from lead 2 so it will again give you a negative s wave here it will again give you a negative s wave after that remember one thing one very interesting thing heart repolarization starts but before repolarization there's a phase when there is nothing left to depolarize and the heart is in refractory period so that is the space when there is this isoelectric st period <laughs> and after st period repolarization begins repolarization begins from the last part of depolarization so it begins from here it begins from here and repolarization begins from here then moves upward so the repolarization vector actually looks like this repolarization vector looks like this it is a negative vector which moves away from you know repolarization starts how repolarization starts over here and after that it moves in the opposite direction so the ultimate resultant vector is this so it's a negative vector which goes away from lead to or which goes away from positive lead lead to so negative moving away will give you a positive or upward deflection here we get a t wave since repolarization is monophasic almost the whole of you know myocardium gets repolarized and repolarization goes happens through the syncytium mostly because most of the purkinje fiber act during repolarization are in refractory period just the reversal doesn't happen on the go at that time so we get a camel hump shape we get a harmonious shape of positive wave at a dome shape of positive wave which is the t wave so that's all about whatever is required for plus mark honors mark and even more from ecg on for routine exam so this much you must understand that what are the i mean what what are the types of waves and how electrically these waves are formed later in a detailed discussion if you send a special request i will also discuss about all the leads and everything and in the next class we will discuss about the long term regulation of bp we will discuss a little bit whatever is left from ecg we will discuss about hemodynamics and other cardiac circulation other circulation than cardiac circulation like cerebral circulation renal circulation whatever is required for your university exam so uh, thank you for your patient hearing you can throughout the week you can send me messages and you can send me questions uh, because next day we will discuss a little bit about the uh, questions that appear in the examination and after that once next day is over we can proudly say that we have done our cvs examination thank you once again